This is the basketball show. What they gonna say next? Hello, I'm Joe Healy. Great to be with you for another episode of the Basketball Show, proudly brought to you by TCL Mobile and News Corp. Shane Hill is with me here as always. Now, Hammer, you called the Hawks Wildcats game I over did. over I the weekend. I called four games. I was busy. You were, as were you in South Australia. I was um, looking fresh today. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> uh, have a bit of a bone to pick with you, though. Okay. Pick what? Away. What is? I have to. I've had to write it down. So, what is rock, scissors, paper? Well, I, I better set it up because <laughs> there, it was getting a bit boring in the game, I must say. It was a blowout <laughs> from uh, Perth. And Gorge is just henpecking one of the referees when there was free throws uh, being taken. And I said, the referees will go rock, scissors, paper to see who's going to be the one that stands next to Gorge next time down. And uh, Peter Hooley goes, rock, scissors, and paper? How old are you? What? What is that? And quite what rightly, is it? What is it? it's paper, scissors, rock. Well, I went home and I said to my kids, I said, you got to back me up here. What is it? And they said, Dad, scissors, paper, rock. So they've gone with a different oh, one again. Oh, okay. So I don't know what it is. I, don't, I can't believe the hard-hitting stuff we <laughs> actually start with here. I love that the game was that interesting <laughs> it was that, that we were talking about paper, scissors, rock. Anyway, it was a Perth, Perth did not do a lot wrong in that game. <laughs> <laughs> that is... Until this. Instead, I'm talking to you. Great performance from your men from the mm. get-go. Yeah, it was really locked into what we're doing defensive. They're a phenomenal uh, scoring team, you know. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. <laughs> now, that is why I don't use that word. I'm not going to say it. He butchered it, but God bless him. He just played through it, didn't yeah, he? Like there he owned was it. Yeah. Confidence. No, he didn't own it. He played through it like he didn't think any of us would notice until Peter Hooley said he act, that was the only thing they butchered for the entire night. The Perth Wildcats were unbelievable. Trev, but bow on that one. <laughs> he's, he's been great. We've called him Coach of the Year. So yeah. we're going to pump him up. We're going to flick yep. him on the nose when he does that. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. You see, you can do it. Yeah. You can say it. A lot of practice. All right, time to go under the spotlight now because the rookie conversation, No, nobody is really... I think just aware of, of who is eligible and who isn't and why they are and why they're not. Where do, Where do you well, stand? Where do you stand? It changes all the time. It used to be a rookie of the year it used to be just for Australians. Mm -hmm. And then they brought in the next stars. So next stars are available. Even though last year LaMelo Ball had already played professionally in Lithuania and he was categorised as a rookie. Mm -hmm. You know, the questions come up that John Mooney is playing exceptional basketball, but he's like DJ Vasilovic, he's just come straight out of college. How is he not a rookie if an next star is yeah, a rookie? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Well, I just, think if it's I just because he's an import is the technicality, is it? Yeah, so imports in the past I don't think have ever been categorised as rookie. But I'm mm -hmm. saying if you're going to add next stars, yeah. shouldn't it just be your first ever season playing professional basketball? Yes. If you've played anywhere else and you've been paid to play, you're no longer a rookie. Yep. That's it. Um, but it doesn't. Another another lifetime ago, um, I went to play college volleyball. You couldn't actually go over and play college volleyball if you had played professionally ever before. And same with basketball. Yeah. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you can't do it. Yeah. But once you come out of that, I mean, yeah, I think it's a really good discussion point about the NBL being able to make some adjustments and get this right because Mooney's been outstanding and his name would certainly be thrown in the ring. Who is your rookie of the year so far? Oh, it's... Tough. Um, DJ's been incredible. Mm -hmm. Vasilovic has been incredible. Uh, White was great before he got injured as well. Great defender. Uh, and then Mooney, you've got to throw that up. It's probably a flip of the coin between DJ and Mooney right now. Justinian Jessup? No. Nah. We talked about him nah. to start with. You see him yesterday? Yeah, okay. Recent, maybe recently, recently the Hawks have fallen off the Now they've wagon. scouted him and he can't get his shot away. He hasn't yeah. been able to find a way to contribute. And, uh, you know, that's part of the learning curve when you come out of college. It's easy when no one knows you. He's a great shooter. Now everyone's shutting him down. He has to find ways to be able to break free. And he, he still could, but, um, you know, he's up against it as well. All right, this lends itself to our TCL starting five this week. Talking about the rookies, the class of rookies that we do have this season yep. is particularly good. I think it's potentially one of the best we've seen. The depth, the mm -hmm. fact that we can't split three or four guys. Normally there's one standout guy. Last year, yep. um, you know, LaMelo was clearly the, the rookie of the year. We haven't even mentioned Josh Giddy in that yet, yeah. who's been exceptional. So I think to have four quality rookies come in, Josh Giddy's an exception because he's only 18. Mm. He's, you know, these other guys we're talking about 
are potentially five years older. So, you know, he's in a class of his own for his age, but probably not going to get Rookie of the Year based on performances so far. I wish I think the likes of like a Tyro Harrison and Luke Travers as well are getting some really good minutes. And so in terms of their progression and development, it's great for them. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I mean, they're not in the same category, obviously, as these other guys. but, no, but they're, you know, par- they're part of that class. They're, they still yeah. contribute to the depth. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No doubt. And uh, Harrison especially. Um, and Wetzel. He, you know, we haven't even mentioned him. Oh, my him. goodness. He's been yeah. incredible, starting for a team that potentially can make the top four as well. Um, so it, it really is the best depth we've ever seen. Really good quality players. And that can be contributed to as well because we've only got two imports. If there was three imports, mm-hmm. maybe they wouldn't be getting the same as well, same opportunities. Yep. So, good year. All right, let's talk about the Hawks. Oh. We mentioned it or oh. alluded to it. They started well. They're still seven and six, but they've lost, uh, what, three of their last nine. They're struggling. Dangadel, have, have we sort of put him a little bit too high in terms of that pedestal? or? Well, I was talking to a few people on the weekend that said he's one of the highest paid Aussies in the competition. Now, I don't know whether that's right or wrong. But I tell you, he has struggled big time, and and so have the Hawks. Maybe we had them a bit too high too early, because Brian Gorgian, if he had any hair, he'd be pulling it out. He's shining that dome, and he he's frustrated, and he's you know he it's hard because he's known as a defensive coach. They can't get stops, they can't beat anyone. They look um, disjointed at the offensive end, and a lot of frustration there. And I'm not sure what the solutions are. They've got the talent, but you certainly don't see them in that top echelon like we did a month ago. Still plenty of time. Of course. Still plenty and, of time. And some of the teams that are firing, plenty of time for them. They have to maintain it as well. So only early, but still you'd rather be in some the sort of posi- The positive being, as I said, they've done themselves the favour early in the season. They're still third on the on the ladder. Yep. They can maintain that, I guess, and yep. see where they go. And let's focus on the NBA a little bit. Blake Griffin to the Nets. Blake Griffin. He's, he's not the person I thought they would get. I thought they'd go mm. for a, a straight-up big man. But... I mean, it's a great acquisition. And, it, I mean, from him personally, this is reviving his career. Oh, no doubt. Talk about accumulating talent. How much talent can you throw on oh. one team? And how much money can they spend to be able to get this? Well, he's because of where he's gotten himself to in his career, he's on a veteran minimum contract for the rest of the season. So he's yeah. not really he being... Out. Yeah, but he's not really from being Detroit. paid for from the net. Yeah. So, so they've accumulated talent. And, and you're right, this revitalises him and puts him in a position to be able to win. Mm. You know, it's been a while since he's been on, you know, winning teams, and we know he was a star in the day. Can he recapture it? That's the question mark, and can he do it amongst those other guys? Certainly a talent. I think so. this is a, 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 a Mello move for me. He's going to be coming mm. off the bench. Carmelo was out and gone, and now yep. he's back, and he's sort of contributing and playing really well again. Potentially. It'll be good to see. It will. Yeah. It will. It's exciting. Uh, Paddy Mills is playing... Really good basketball. Yep. He's averaging his, his best throughout his career, but that means that he's put on been put on the trade table again. What do we think? Nah. You no. You can't trade Paddy. You can't trade Paddy. He's the heart well, and soul of the he, Spurs he right is. now. Um, the Bucks are apparently interested and the 76ers are apparently interested. Well, he, he fits both of those That squads. could be really fun. It might be. I mean, Paddy seems like the sort of guy he'd love to be able to finish his career yeah. in San Antonio. Yeah. He seems that loyal sort of guy. He's entrenched there. But if it happened, imagine going to the Bucks where you'd play a major role in trying to win the East or the Sixers. Mm-hmm. And that's what these teams are doing, trying to accumulate little pieces that can really give them that advantage in the second half of the year. And uh, he would fit both of those teams perfectly. Now, you and I have just been talking. Uh, Ryan Brokoff is back out of quarantine, training yep. with the Phoenix. Um, he looks like he's blowing hard, yeah. but, but it's great. When was the last time he played? Before the bubble. It's been a while. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be tough for him. I mean, we know how great a player he is. He's a star, and he's great at the defensive end as well. International star. Um, NBA talent, no doubt, um, and we expect him to do great things. But how long is it going to take before he does it? There's nothing worse than if you've been injured or you've been out and you come in playing against guys that have done their preseason. they're already 10, 15 games into their season. It takes a bit of time to be able to get your wind, but not only your wind, just feeling, you know, the sliding, getting around screens, you know, a bit of fumble, shooting at game pace, coming mm. off on balls, and people are going to be all over him because he's a star. So... 
I wouldn't expect huge things straight away. He's not going to get any open shots. I'm going to be right on him every time. Where do you see him fitting into the team and the, the, the dynamic of the team moving forward from here? I think that it would be smart for them to ease him in. And when I say ease him in, you know, not playing 10 minutes, but you're playing him probably 20 minutes where yeah. you know he's going to play 30, 35 minutes. Um, but they've got a lot of talent. So this is going to be a big adjustment for a lot of players. You look at Ruben Tarangi, <laughs> he's going to get hardly any minutes at all uh, over time. I think, come the end of the season. Um, Sykes still to come back. Glidden's playing great basketball. We've spoken about Kyle Adnam. Yeah. So people are going to have to sacrifice a little bit, which they will, but they've been unbelievably inconsistent, uh, Phoenix. They've got a lot of talent. They just can't string wins together. It's time now for Points Made. Let's bring in former NBL MVP Derek Rucker. D-Ruck, hello to you. I'm going to start with a tough one, I think. Should Larry Kesselman be able to maintain his ownership of the NBL and also continue to have a stake in Melbourne United? D-Ruck, you first. Well, Joe, once again, I think this gets back to a transparency issue. We don't know how much he owns in Melbourne United, and we hear rumours about his ownership and other clubs as well. I think the NBL firstly needs to come out and let us know what stakes he has in which clubs, and then we can decide whether or not. So right now, I think because he's a buyer, and there may not be there may not be any buyers out there, Shane, if he wants to sell. So I think right now he's just got to stay with it as it is and let the league continue to try and improve. Well, we're answering for Dan Ewing here because he was the one who sent it on Twitter. And, uh, you know, I think it's easy in black and white world. You'd say, no, you wouldn't have somebody who owns the league to be able to own an individual team. But it's not black and white. Uh, it's difficult. And we only yeah. got a Brisbane team because Larry was prepared to be able to hold on to that for the last five years. If he didn't do that, we would, he, in his ownership, we wouldn't actually have it. Uh, I think in a perfect world, you would want to know what he's got with Melbourne United. In a perfect world, you wouldn't want him owning any of the teams. I don't reckon he would either. So he'd want to be able to get rid of them if they're buyers, but we know it's not a perfect world. Would either of you two be interested in purchasing a stake in a team? Not me. Shane, maybe. He's, <laughs> he's been, the one that's loaded, not I've me. I've been, been there, done that. I had my 10% share of the Sydney Kings. Not for me. All right, let's move on. After defeating the Wildcats and United this weekend... Are the bullets the real deal? Hammer you first. Well, you've got to start second-guessing your opinion from the start, which was what I didn't think they would make the top four. They're playing great basketball at the moment. I think Hodgson's been the key. They needed that third person. He's been active. He's rebounded. He had a big game on the weekend. But I'm still second-guessing that when push comes to shove and they get to the playoffs, they're not beating one of the powerhouses in a best-of-three or best-of-five series. What are you talking about? They just beat a powerhouse yesterday. And your, uh, your, you and Andrew Gaze's, your disrespect to the great man, John Casey, the other night was shameful. Both of you guys should pin letters and put them out in the media apologizing to John Casey, one of the greatest sports casters in Australian history. He made a comment. You guys jumped down his throat and look what happens. The Bullets go out and beat Melbourne United. They are legitimate. Well, again, you're getting carried away about what happens at this stage of the season. Let's see what happens at the end of the year. Then there'll be apologies made. All right, guys, let's talk about the Cairns Taipans. They're 4-10 and 10 on the season. Is there serious pressure on Mike Kelly right now? d -Ruck, make your point. Ooh, there's a tough one. Obviously, Mo King is my guy up there, and we don't talk about these types of issues, and my observations are strictly... From what I see, and when I look into those timeouts of the Cans Taipans, I do not see a team that's engaged. I do not see a team that's interested. They're losing some bad games. The chemistry between Oliver and Machado doesn't look as good as it does as it did last season. And right now, Shane, I think they look really, really poor and headed for a wooden spoon. Well, they do look poor, but I don't think you can point the finger at Mike Kelly. You don't go from coach of the year to somebody who doesn't know what he's doing. I think it comes down to more Cam Oliver than anybody else because his body language is the poorest of anyone on the court. You see Machado, he's still busting his butt to try and get it done. I'd love to see the passion from Oliver. He's an NBA talent, but he's just not bringing it at both ends of the court that he actually shows that he cares, and that's why he's not in the NBA. All right, let's move on. Uh, Hammer, coming straight back to you, who's the best big in the league right now? 
Well, it's a tough one. I'm not sure we've seen this many good bigs for a long time. And uh, we've we've been big fans of Jock Landale since the season started. I don't think he's playing his best basketball. He's still with the best big. I also had Martin as one of the best bigs. But right now, John Mooney's actually passed him. He's playing incredible basketball and growing in front of our eyes. He's going to be a superstar by the end of the year. So I've probably got Landale, Mooney, and then I've got Martin La uh, third just because he's been out for the last few weeks. Okay, Shane, I'm going to have to go in a different order. I've got John Mooney right now as the best big man in the competition. I think he plays for the best team in the competition, as I said before. Right now, Jock Landell is struggling because he's had a lot of pieces in and out of the lineup. It's very hard to judge where he's at. He's played good basketball. No shame in what he's done thus far. But I think once Melbourne United start to get their pieces back, we'll start to see the best of Jock Landell. And then also... You know who's been a bit sneaky off the bench is Matt Hodgson. He's starting to show signs like what we've expected of him for years. I think Hodgson is doing a really good job. He's not one of the top three, but any given night, he can be the best big on the floor. I'm surprised neither of you mentioned DJ. Where does he fit for you? Wow. DJ, all, this has kind of been the plight of DJ's basketball career, always being left out of the conversation. And DJ is really good. But I think now it's a situation where some of the newer guys, you know, there's a bit of recency bias. And I think everyone is infatuated with Landale and Mooney, obviously. And I think those guys just bring a little bit of spark that DJ doesn't at the moment. And I think the other thing for DJ, he's been unbelievably consistent for a long time. But he's not playing on a team that's in contention. So I think when yeah. teams not getting the same sort of results, you don't hold them in the same esteem. And Mooney's playing with probably within the best system in the NBL right now, and he looks switched on. Had yep. to get the uh, Adelaide shout out in there anyway, guys. Obviously, yeah, um, question without notice, Derek, to you first: Should there be an NBL All Star game? I think so. I mean, we're playing um, we're playing the season as it is. Why not go for? an all-star game. There's ample time to get it done. We can play it on a Sunday. Guys have Monday off and then back to the competition. But Shane, we loved it. Like, I love being able to get out there with you. And back in the day, there was a bit of rivalry between uh, me and you and Andrew and DMAC. And it was great because every year they thought they were going to crush us. And I think we were undefeated in our all-star game appearances for the mighty North. <laughs> of course we did. I think if it happened again, you'd have to go Americans versus Australians. I think that's where yeah. the pride would be. And I think it would be a really good contest. And I think the Americans would be all out to be able to try and hold up that, that end. And I think the Aussies would do exactly the same. And it'd probably be a little bit more interest. Hold on, no. Where do you put the, where do you put the Kiwis? Uh, oh, I good haven't even thought about the Kiwis. They, they're a local, <laughs> mate. What are you talking about? It's imports versus locals, not Aussies. Thank you. Beautiful, guys. Derek, thank you so much. Love chatting to you every week. We'll see you next week. And thank you also, everyone, for sending in the questions. Keep them coming. We love hearing from everyone who watches the show. And, uh, yeah, makes for a good conversation. Okay, we're going in-depth today and we've got a basketball show exclusive and we've got a mate of mine from the juniors. We've got Damian Cotter all the way from the Chicago Bulls. Welcome, mate. Great to see your face. G'day, Shane. Good to see you as well. Uh, it's great to be here and, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to hear, hear a friendly accent, you know, it's uh, after three years of being over here. Well, mate, we're, we're really proud of you. I'm proud of you because I've seen you from, you know, playing juniors to working with you at the Sydney Kings and knowing over the last few years, you went over there, not with a whole lot of promises, but you're assistant coach in the G League. You got elevated to another team, to the lead coach. And then you were the head coach of another team, and now you're on the bench for the Chicago Bulls. You must be pinching yourself, mate. Yeah, it's been crazy. Like, I like literally came over for just six months and um, just kept tripping in opportunities. And, and, and the thing I've enjoyed here is if you work, put your head down, you work. There's so many people watching, and I've been so fortunate in who I've worked uh, with and, and the opportunities that I've been given. But... It's been great. I've, I've not only been given opportunities, I've lived in really good cities and, and I've had a really good experience here. Has anything surprised you about working over in the NBA so far? Uh, look, they, it, the, the, work, the, the work rate is immense and, and I knew it would be and I was prepared for it. And, and, uh, 
but it's it's full on like uh it, it's it's long days and and there's not much rest and there's always a lot of things to do and um so even though i knew it and i was i thought i was prepared for it but now that i've lived half a season and i think this season's a little unique with covid um you know that's been intense that's been a really really intense i i wouldn't even know how to quantify my learnings yet i just haven't had much time to reflect what about uh share with us the first time you walk in to the team's venue especially chicago and i would imagine the memorabilia and the history in that stadium and the team's team plane all the rest of it i bet you wish you had a mate there saying can you believe i'm right here with the bulls oh it's crazy shane like like every day you know you put um because you know it's basketball community is a small world like one of the, my fellow staff members john bryant uh, i coached at knox knox raiders in melbourne and uh, we were talking about it the other day and just how much we get a kick out of you know just putting on the track suit and we got you know we've got the, the little bull there and you know it's 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 not real it's just it's a surreal it's every day you you pinch yourself like you said it's um we're very lucky the Bulls are making a bit of noise at the moment, the likes of a, a Zach Levine, who is elite. How much how much do you work with him? What's it like seeing these guys behind the scenes? Uh, it's like Zach's, um, Zach's you, you don't think you're the same species with, of, of, when you watch Zach operate during, on a day-to-day. You know, um, he does some phenomenal physical acts behind closed doors. And uh, what makes Zach... Um, even more special. He's a good bloke. Like he's really easy to coach. Um, you know, I don't look after him directly, but uh, um, I speak to him during practice and he's really easy to interact with. And he, he's a very, very good teammate and really cares about the right things. So I, I think that's a privilege in itself. And if you wanted to expand on that, you know, I've watched some pretty good players this season up close. Speaking of the day to day, what do you, what, it's your role. What what are you responsible for on the day to day and scouting and all the rest of it? Well, I I'm in charge of player development, so I coordinate that. Now that's what that means is um, a lot of things, um, and I, I I probably wear the cap that that I wore more when I was working at the Institute of Sport in New South Wales. But I basically manage the room. I, I've got my own players. I'm directly responsible for. Um, I'm in charge of the return to play. We've got two players, Larry Marketing and Otto Porter. I worked them out today because they're coming back from injury. Um, and then along with that, I, I have a full load of scouts, um, which uh, that we all share. We share the workload with all the coaches. And, you know, I'm doing a scout, you know, every nine, 10, 11 days, um, which is a fair bit of work to go into. So you want to get those scout wins, Shane. <laughs> if we have Damien Cotter on the basketball show in five years' time, where do you see yourself? Where do you want to be? Uh, it's, I, I don't, I've never really looked at things like that. Like I said, I came over here just for six months. Um, I really believe uh, be where your feet are and, and just do with the job. And if you said to me 10 years ago, hey, you're going to be sitting you know, on a bench with an NBL team, I would have taken and that, and that's all you get. I would have taken it. So I, I'm pretty fortunate what I've got. Um, I, you know, the good thing about the NBA, people talk. And and uh, I just think you just got to, you know, once you get here, you just got to do your job and whatever happens, happens. I know that's not a great answer for you, Joe, but that's, <laughs> that, that, that's the truth. That's how I see it. Well, I, I tell you what, mate, if you're a player with the success you've had through hard work and you know, being able to fit in and learn and, and be a great teammate, you would be on the back pages of Australian sport. But you're a bit of a secret back here and we're really proud that we we're able to put you out to everybody so they can appreciate the success you're having and uh, let you know, mate, we're proud of you and uh, we appreciate you coming on and telling your story. Uh, thank, thanks, Shane. I, I was, uh, it looks like I've dodged the hard questions of my role in the under-12 Ringwood Hawks. <laughs> Premiership team. <laughs> Good memories, mate. I'll never forget it. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I think my role was I clapped, and then every once in a while, our coach John Walsh let me throw the ball in bounds to you. I think that's where, that's how I remember it. Just mate. set set screens, mate, and take the ball out of the net. We'll Perfect. be good. <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks very much for having me on, guys. Thanks, Damien. Cheers. Thanks, mate. Congrats. All right, great to hear from Damien Cotter. They're certainly doing amazing things over in the States. You guys have spent a lot of time together. Yep. Do you have any sort of favourite memories or anything like that? Outside of the juniors, I used to give it to him a little bit because uh, when he started coaching in the old Siebel, he used to time out, he used to go out to the centre of the court and he'd like have this Pat Riley strut as he was walking to the time out. It was like a, a big show. I used to give it to him about, but he is a champion. And like I said before, I'm really proud of the efforts that he's he's done and the success he's had. Well done to you, Damien Cotter. Yeah, absolutely. You can tell he's, he's loving what he's doing, but working yep. really hard at yep. the same time. Yeah, awesome stuff. All right, we've got one more round left of the NBL Cup. Ooh. A few teams that we want to Let's look go. at. Who we got? Well, first of all, the ladder. Perth Bullets, Melbourne United, Sydney, six and a half points separating first and fourth. So still really anyone's game. Mm -hmm. Although, we'll go to Perth first. They've won five of their last six. They play the Breakers and 36ers on oh, their run home. home. They, they are feel, home of the cup. They can't lose now, No, no, really. they're, they're, they're home. They are a machine right now. And we've pumped up Trevor Gleeson and his systems and what he does. We know Bryce Cotton's the best player in the league. But what I'm most impressed about is all of their role players coming to play. And they'll double-team Bryce Cotton, and their systems allow them. They go high-low, they get little easy ones. They're the best at running their counters. So they've got a system that everyone knows what they're doing. Mm. If one thing's taken away, they hit them with a counter on the backside, just so well drilled. A lot of the teams just play what's in front of them. They don't have the same strategies, and you wonder why they have ups and downs, and uh, they don't have the same talent as everybody else. And with the emergence of Mooney, they are looking good. If, if Bryce gets his citizenship and they bring in another... American, watch out. They're going to go to another level again because they need a four-man. That's where they're down. The Sydney Kings. They beat Phoenix over the weekend. They've got the Hawks and Bullets. They haven't beaten either of those two teams this season, yep. but it feels like they're also sort of on an upward trend. Oh, oh, there hasn't been enough spoken about the Sydney Kings. They've had, um, they've had two of their best players, Cooks out all year and Martin out for the last month. I challenge you, what team, if you took two of their best three or four players out, are going to be six and seven like the Sydney Kings and winning some of these games? You, if you took Bryce Cotton and Blanchfield out, they're not seven and four. They're probably not six and seven. But you could go all the way through every single team and take the two, two of their best players, and there's no way they're six and seven. They have done unbelievably well. Um, some of the players that are coming off the bench... Uh, have been incredible as well. They've played a really good role. DJ's been outstanding. Casper's been really good as well. But some of the lesser-known players have really stood up. They've been impressive to me. Yep, definitely. I've really liked Geordie Hunter this season as Hunter's well. Hunter's been good. Yeah. Um, Melbourne United, the next one. So Chris Golding back. They've lost Scotty Hobson for three to four weeks. Yep. But th that just is an example of the depth that they've got. And White. White's been out. True. Jack White. Exactly. So they've had their injury battles as well. Yep. They were never going to how undefeated. I mean, no, that was, that but was it's still, it, it still feels like there's no qualms for them. It still feels no. like they'll be there at the end of the season regardless. They're, I still think they're going to win it. You know, these are just sort of the little ups and downs, the little speed humps you hit that is actually good for Dean Vickerman because he can use this to be able to make his team better. He'll challenge them the longer the season goes on. They'll be watching a lot of videotape. Take a lot of pride. When you come out and say for Jock Landau, we're going to get undefeated for the whole year, and you lose a couple of games, it stings. Because mm. it's like pride. It's like, we need to fix this now. We know we're not unbeatable now. We know we've got work to do. We know this season's so close. Um, they're going to be more than fine. They're well, still going to They're going to beat the Phoenix by eight points on Wednesday night, apparently. So. so lock it in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we go, it's time for our top five plays of the week. The Bullets are kicking things off this week. At number five, it's Jason Kadee finding Vic Law at the rim. Both teams are just one foul in this quarter. And how about that for a high percentage play as Vic Law cuts back to excellent pass, spectacular finish. You call it, Liam. Next up, Cairns came up big on the boards against the Kings. This from Cam Oliver was pretty impressive. Couldn't convert Oliver against multiple opponents. He grabbed the ball and makes the pay. That's what we want from Space Cam. Get work done around the bucket. It's the offensive rebound. Too big, too strong, too explosive. Melbourne United held off the breakers. 
At number three, it's their big man, Jock Landau, doing it at both ends. So now he's running the floor. He's oh, with a goodness. Great defense. Great defense to keep Corey Webster in front of him. Changes shot. And what an incredible run to the basket. And finish. At two, Jordy Hunter dropped 15 as the Kings got past the Phoenix. On this occasion, Ruben Tarangi didn't stand a chance. Well, let's not forget, too, that... Oh, Jordan Hunter! Caught it, went upstairs and threw it down. Well, he got the contact, he twisted as he dunked it. That is a great dunk. The, uh, the great doesn't do it justice, Hammer. He got hit, hit oh. twist, and he's that high, showing the elite athleticism and tucks it in with the two hands. And finally, Matt Hodgson capped off the Bullets' back-to-back -back wins, putting Mason Peatling on a poster. Hodgson puts the emphasis on the result with the hammer dunk. And a little bit of advice to go with it. I tell you what, a photographer is earning strength today if he gets that one. Don't worry, Pete, the photographer definitely got the money shot. While Chris Golding pretty much summed up Melbourne United's mood. This is a co-production by News Corp Australia and Closer Sports.